Bom dia para você que é de bom dia, boa noite para você que é da boa noite, boa tarde, se você acabou de entrar no YouTube. Hoje vai ser um pouquinho diferente, então só uma instrução em português que nós vamos trocar para inglês, porque nós temos um convidado internacional hoje e eu estou até nervoso. Mas é o seguinte, você vem aqui, aperta é, legendas e depois escolher tradução para inglês. And then you can read the subtitles. So, well, I have no words how to describe the person I'm interviewing today, because if you're telling me, you know who he is. He doesn't need an introduction. But I'd like to thank you a lot, Mr. Lomilo Duquette, to have you with us in the show today. Well, thank you for inviting me. It's my pleasure. Well, thank you very much to be here. Well, the first question that we usually ask about our, our guests is how did you begin in the magic world? Uh, the question is how does a normal person end up like 50 years later writing thousands of books and traveling the world and writing music and singing and, and playing living telema? And how does it begin? Well, I... Uh, I I'm not sure that anyone can describe themselves as being normal. <laughs> not you or me or, or anyone. So, uh, but uh, I uh, always seemed, even as a, as a child, to uh, see the, the more uh, mystical side of things. And uh, there were there were a few things that as a as a child that uh, uh, sort of got me off on a mystical footing. And uh, foremost is uh, the fact that uh, when I was about two and a half years old, just when I was starting to walk, uh, they discovered that uh, I had a a bone disease in my hip and it was called Perthes disease. I don't know what they call it now, but there was no uh, uh, treatment or no cure except just to put me back in bed and hope that I grew out of it. And uh, so just as I was, just as other children are starting to uh, Uh, go out and play and, and learn the language of their parents and everything. Uh, I was allowed to uh, lay comfortably on my back in bed. And uh, I was allowed sort of to keep my infant memories. And uh, all of us have these infant memories when we're, when we're babies. Uh, but we forget them as soon as we start uh, going out in the world and playing and things like that. And infant memories, I guess, are very unique things because I remembered uh, uh, episodes from previous incarnations. And uh, so I... I Eventually, I grew out of that disease, of course, and I started walking around and, and such. But uh, my, uh, I was allowed to register and crystallize uh, memories, pre-linguistic memories that uh, um, most people uh, aren't allowed to uh, uh, to keep, and that more or less to, uh, indicated to me. Uh, the nature of my own being. And I started to uh, uh, think about my own existence in, in ways that many people don't get a chance to be that introspective. And uh, uh, I grew up in a, a evangelical kind of Christian environment. And I always thought that that was absolutely nonsense. It completely, I, I, from the very beginning, I said, I can't believe grown-ups believe this. <laughs> and uh, 
So uh, in my late teens, when I uh, came out to California in the 19, uh, mid 1960s, uh, I had a chance to uh, uh, take LSD. And uh, from that moment forward, uh, I knew there was much more to my mind and much more to the human mind and the human psyche and uh, than uh, uh, I ever dreamed possible. And that uh, my own mind and was going to be the only thing in life really worth uh, seeking to discover more about. And that got me into Eastern mysticism and Eastern mysticism eventually got me into Western mysticism and Kabbalah and uh, uh, ceremonial magic. So that's it in a nutshell. And you had become a Freemason too. Here in Brazil, lots of um, telemates are Freemasons. I am, um, Raposo is, and uh, several other uh, members. How do you see the connection between the Freemason and Telema? Well, for me, my father was a Freemason, and he was one of the most noble men I've ever met in my life. He was a, a very noble, wonderful, uh, honest character. And his morality was, uh, uh, he was not an evangelical Christian like my mother. He was almost, he was almost an agnostic. He said he would be an atheist, but he couldn't be an atheist because you can't be an atheist and a Mason too. <laughs> and he loved being a Mason. And I, uh, but he was a very moral and honest and noble character. And, uh, but it wasn't because of any religious reason. No religion told him to be moral and good and upright. He was good just because being good's a human way to be. And I always observed that that particular magic of his character was something that he got out of masonry. So uh, I always wanted to grow up to be a mason, but I didn't get to do it until I was 50 years old. And by that time, I had spent a good 25 years in uh, uh, occult orders, the uh, uh, Martinists and the, the uh, OTO and the AA. And uh, so I, I got all of my occult ex experience or a lot of my occult experience uh, first, and then I joined the Masons. Uh, and it became a, a beautiful, wonderful revelation to me. Uh, I, uh, especially the degree ceremonies themselves, the initiatory degree ceremonies uh, were uh, I recognized as being pure magic as, as far as a, a, a ceremonial uh, way to trigger uh, an altered state of consciousness uh, uh, in the candidate. And uh, so I could easily see at that point why the, the magicians of the Golden Dawn, at least initially, were high degree Freemasons, because it's a, sort of a soul liberating uh, uh, process. Uh, you're not a slave to the church, or you're not a slave to to uh, any particular philosophy that that would artificially uh, uh, in enslave your your soul, if you will. And uh, so I see uh, masonry uh, uh, not as a you know a, an overt magical magical uh, uh, process, 
but it is completely magical in what it does and, and how it does it. I wouldn't dream of uh, expecting my uh, Masonic uh, or many of my Masonic brothers down at my local lodge to appreciate or understand my magic, magic or Kabbalah interests, even though I tell them, hey, this is, Masons have been doing this for years, <laughs> you know, they go, oh, well, okay, that's, yeah. Uh, but uh, so, and, and many, many of my uh, uh, brothers and sisters in the OTO uh, are Masons or co-Masons or belong to Masonic uh, uh, organizations, so. But that doesn't mean all, ma all, ma all Masons are magicians. Many magicians are Masons, but, but uh, certainly not all uh, Masons would even call what Masonry is magic, but it is. <laughs> you are well known for being a musician as well as a magician. So the, uh, the first question that they, they told me to ask you is uh, what is magic to you and how does magic connect to music? Uh, well, first of all, uh, all art is magic. All art is magic and all artists are magicians okay they may may not understand why but uh, that's true art is magic it's creative expression it's making the invisible visible it's making the inaudible audible it uh, uh, is magic of the of the highest uh, nature. And uh, when an artist sets to work to create either musically or paintings or sculpture or, or dance, they're doing magic. They're making magic. Magic, as Crowley, uh, defined it was causing change to occur in conformity with will. It's a, that's a simple, simple definition. So any willed uh, action is a, is a magical act. Blowing your nose is a magical act if it's your will to blow your nose, okay? Uh, magic as it's classically uh, performed, uh, we usually think of the, the type of magic that has its archetypes in, uh, in the West anyway, uh, with uh, medieval magical art, art forms that uh, have traditions going back to uh, uh, Sumeria, Babylon, Egypt, uh, and then the, the, the Solomonic formula of, of magic where uh, you're dealing with, with spirit evocation and, and calling up spirits and angels and demons and, uh, and uh, interacting with them. So they interact in your life for, for your own uh, uh, benefit. But the, the idea that there is an objective reality behind all of that is, uh, well, magic as we, as we know it today could be called uh, uh, psychology on steroids. Super psychology. Um, 
the the ideas coming to us now from the from quantum physics on the nature of reality and the nature of consciousness uh, the elements of that new information that we're now dealing with concerning the human mind and the the limitless potential of the human mind as it relates to consciousness. Magicians have been utilizing the tools without understanding the tools, but they've been utilizing them effectively for thousands of years. And magic as we as we think of it, where we dress up in in robes and have wands and and uh, call uh, demons and spirits by name and everything else. Yes, that's very that's very real. Okay, but it's real in a way that was not completely understood by the ancient magicians. They projected upon it an objective reality, as if that spirit was a was a hard thing. Uh, Okay, instead of an infinitely potential uh, idea. Uh, so when when magicians uh, perform a magical act to have uh, uh, to, to affect a change in their own life by affecting a change in their own consciousness, they're sort of dealing on a quantum quantum level where time does not exist the way we think that it exists. Space is not as real as we think space is, okay? So magicians who have, have in the past been seen as uh, uh, transcending time and space with their magic are really just working things on a, on a quantum level using uh, creative visualization and the powers of concentrated uh, uh, will. So magic uh, at the moment is a cutting edge technology. And Aleister Crowley uh, was among the first to start seeing this as a cutting edge spiritual technology rather than a superstitious uh, art form. So magic to me is, uh, I don't differentiate anything I do in life as being magical or unmagical. It's all magic, okay? It's all magic. So uh, it, uh, uh, and, and I do it to, to make my life magic and not, I don't make magic my life, okay? I don't make magic my life, I, I, try, I use magic to make my life magic, okay, if, if that makes sense. Yes, makes perfect sense. Okay. Uh, next question was, what is Telema to you? And why did you choose this path instead of all the, the vast gamma of, of paths available? Why Telema? Well, um, Thelema is something that just uh, I've always been. <laughs> it's, I didn't choose to be a Thelemite. Uh, when, I, when I started to find out about what uh, Thelema was, I just realized uh, that's just a name for what I've always known myself to be. And... Uh, uh, so it wasn't like I made a, a big conscious decision that said, well, when I was a child, I was a Methodist. And now I think I'm going to stop being a Methodist and start being a magician. I, I never made a decision like that. Okay, the, the uh, Thelema, you know, whose watchword is do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law. 
uh, is simply uh, the process or a thelemite is someone who strives to figure out what their will is in the universe, what their place in the universe is. They first of all strive to find out what their will is. And then when they find it or think they find it, found it, then they proceed to execute that will, to do that will. So uh, we see thelemites all around us that don't know that there is a name for what they are. Most thelemite magicians in the world don't think of themselves as thelemites or magicians, but we see them all around us. People whose lives demonstrate that they have found out what their will in life is and they are doing the best they can to execute that will. So that's Thelema. And deep down inside, every one of us know that we're special, that there is, that we are here for some reason of some kind. Otherwise, we wouldn't be here. We wouldn't be unless there was a purpose for us being. So a Thelema or a Thelemite uh, tries to discover that one thing, we're all here to do something. Not only that, we're here to do something that only we can do. Otherwise, we wouldn't be here. There's nothing in the universe that has no, has no purpose. There's not an atom. There's not a subatomic particle that doesn't have its job to do, its place in the universe. And the, the thing that makes Thelema even a, a, a concept that we can identify is the fact that uh, someone like Mr. Crowley uh, actually gave a name to this term. For centuries, we've had this idea of, I'm going to try to do God's will. I'm going to do God's will, you know. Fine. That's better than someone not trying to do, <laughs> just blindly going through life. That was, a, that was a step forward for a while in human consciousness to try to do God's will. But God's a big thing. And it's kind of stupid for us to try to outguess the omniscient machinery of the cosmos and figure out what our how we we can do that we can cooperate with that it's much easier and much more appropriate for us to, to discover what our will is and when we truly discover what our will is we we discover that it's exactly the same thing we would be doing if we actually discovered what God's will for us was. So that's, that's the Lima. And, and when I first read the book of the law, uh, it wasn't like lightning struck me or anything like that. I burned my book of the law the first time I read it, which I, and I felt really stupid for, for doing that. Um, but uh, yeah, when I asked my initiator, Phyllis, uh, Phyllis Seckler, uh, I said, why did I burn my book of the law? And she said, well, you, you've got an obedience streak in you, Lon. She says, you got to watch that. <laughs> so, 
but when I when I talk to to Phyllis, when I talk to Grady, when I talk to Regarde, uh, they showed me how simple, how simple the idea of uh, do what thou wilt is, and they made made Thelema uh, a, a broad, broad generic. Uh, uh, concept that was that was so much more easy uh, to comprehend uh, than uh, you know a complex uh, idea or, or or philosophy. So. No, oh. and uh, you say. You are the oldest OTO member still alive. And uh, you have been, you have given us some lectures about it. So how does it feel to be the oldest OTO member still alive? Weird, okay. Because I feel like a kid, okay. Uh, I may not be the oldest member of the OTO. There's probably people that are older than 72, I think. Uh, Bob Stein is older than I, but he hasn't been in the order longer than I have. Okay, the, I was uh, initiated uh, Minerval on November fifteenth. I've just uh, just had an anniversary, November fifteenth, nineteen seventy five, and uh, I've been an active member ever ever since. So no one's been in the, no living person has been in the order longer than I, I guess is the more accurate way to put it. Uh, and it feels okay. Uh, uh, people are polite to me because I'm an old fart. <laughs> and having traveled the world, how do you see the difference between telemites around the world, from Brazil or Europe, or United States, and East or West Coast? Um, they, they practice the same rituals. How, how do you feel telema uh, works around in different countries? Uh, well, I've been very, very uh, lucky uh, to be able to travel uh, to many countries. And to, to answer your question is I don't I don't see a difference. Okay, I see a language difference, uh, but the uh, the the people are remarkably the same. We've we've all we all seem to have a very similar auras, if if that makes sense uh, uh, to you. Uh, yes, I feel instantly at home uh, in my host families or my host uh, hosts homes when I travel abroad. And uh, uh, there's always kind of the same mix of people. There's people that that uh, uh, seem like they want to take it very very seriously, and they're okay. Uh, which is fine, but I found much to my delight that uh, it's easy to make my OTO or my Thelemic brothers and sisters, it's easy to make them laugh. And uh, to me, that is a, a, a very important sign. Uh, of uh, it's of spiritual integrity when uh, a person is ready and willing and capable of laughing at themselves, and uh, that's one of the things that uh, impresses me the most with my Thelemic brothers and sisters is their sense of humor. And how do you see the, the beginning of your, I would say career, but it's not a career, it's a path. How would I say that in English? Uh, 
40 years ago and now. Do you see any change in the way people practice Telemann 40 years ago and, and now? Yeah, well, there's much more of them. <laughs> there's many more, more of them right now. Um, but yes, yes. And, uh, and I think in a very good way. The, uh, at the very beginning of my uh, career, my, my uh, journey in, in Thelema, uh, for the first couple of years, I only had my older mentors, people who actually uh, uh, studied with Crowley. Okay. Uh, they were the, the, I looked to them for all of my, all of my cues of what a, what uh, a fellow might, uh, might grow into. There was uh, Phyllis Seckler, who was Phyllis McMurtry. She was married to Grady McMurtry, uh, who uh, more or less resurrected the OTO. Phyllis was my, uh, was my AA teacher and uh, uh, Grady was the head of the OTO. And uh, then there was Francis Israel Regardi, and uh, who was Crowley's secretary in the 1920s. And there was Helen Parsons Smith. Uh, now, uh, Phyllis and Helen, uh, were personal family friends, became first personal family friends. Now, Helen Parsons Smith was the widow of both Jack Parsons, the rocket scientist, strange angel, uh, and Wilfred Smith, the lodge, both of them lodge masters of Agape Lodge OTO in uh, uh, California uh, during Crowley's life. And uh, they were the only people I could I could look to. I, I you know do they do rituals every day? Do they uh, uh, even the OTO rituals that initiated me? There was only two three people. At, these old people at the, my my initiations. You know there wasn't there wasn't a group. These people just personally performed the initiation ceremonies uh, for me. So now uh, there's a, a wonderful group dynamic that's, that's formed over the years, remarkably fast, as a matter of fact. Uh, and uh, the, the OTO, anyway, has, has developed in a, in a way that uh, never, ever happened in Crowley's lifetime. The OTO was something in Crowley's mind, okay? The, the degrees that he gave out uh, 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 over the years, uh, for the most part, weren't ceremonies with, with accoutrements and things like that. Perhaps he did a couple Minervals but all of the degree rituals were in his mind and on paper in manuscripts. It was up to, uh, at first, uh, Wilfred Smith and uh, the Agape Lodge people in California to do the Minervals and firsts and second degrees. That's how uh, Grady McMurtry got in. That's how, how uh, uh, Phyllis Seckler and Helen Parsons Smith that's how they got in. And then when Crowley died, the OTO almost died. And uh, it was only through the, through the efforts of uh, uh, the, the surviving members. Uh, and uh, because uh, Carl Germer, who officially took over the OTO at Crowley's death, uh, saw and, and decided that it was more important to keep Crowley's literary effects uh, in publication. 
than it was to uh, continue uh, uh, initiating uh, people in, in, into the OTO. He, he, he saw his job as, as keeping the publishing uh, going. And uh, it was probably a pretty good idea because none of us might even be here talking uh, had that not have, uh, uh, not have happened. But uh, uh, the OTO in the United States has been remarkably uh, successful uh, to the degree that there's enough uh, membership in the various uh, degrees throughout the, the many degrees of the OTO to uh, be able to establish and maintain the governing uh, bodies as imagined by Crowley in, in documents. And it's, uh, it's working pretty well. Now, I don't think uh, as much as we'd like to uh, imagine Thelema and the OTO and magic being a big worldwide popular, popular thing. I just don't see that, that uh, happening. It's pretty, it's pretty subtle. I don't think there'll there will be millions and millions of people ever joining the, uh, the OTO. If they did, it just probably wouldn't be much, uh, you know, recognizable uh, order. It'll always be, I think, uh, somewhat uh, uh, relatively small uh, in the thousands rather than in the millions. Uh, so. I have the, the almost the same thing. Uh, I have a question for Ana Luisa. She said, what about the newer generation of Tilema? Is there a difference? Because now it's easier to access books, rituals, everything, or the profound questions of the soul are immutable in that sense of searching. Because uh, if we were in back in the 70s or 60s, we wouldn't have this conversation. I would have to send you a letter and then right. Right, and then travel to the United States and then see if we can meet and it would take months. And now we had about 60 telemites just hearing you from Brazil. We have people from all over the country here and some from Portugal. And it's now everything is so lightning flash. How do right. you see these things? Uh, well, I, I think it's, uh, it's great. <laughs> I think it's wonderful. Uh, and not only that, uh, uh, after doing this for 45 years, I can't wait for the young, younger Thelemites to just take over, the, take over the system. What's going to happen and what uh, uh, is obvious is that we're going to have to uh, figure out a way uh, to continue to do the dramatic ceremonial rituals in such a way that they can be done virtually. The, the pandemic has uh, uh, underscored the need, well, like in the OTO, we can't do OTO initiations with the pandemic, with the restrictions, uh, the necessary restrictions that uh, that's keeping us alive at the moment. But there is so much that we can do virtually that would at least approximate the experience, the transformative experience, the personal mutation experience of being initiated, of an initiation ceremony. Uh, even, even today, I, I, I see you and I see four, three other people uh, that, are, that are watching right now. Hello, everybody. Uh, we could potentially be four officers 
in an initiation ceremony. Uh, and the old Thelemites, like myself, uh, although we uh, may have the imagination to, uh, uh, to dream of advances like that in magical technology, uh, I, for one, don't have the technical, <laughs> the technical skills uh, to do it. But uh, uh, I'm very encouraged by the, the waves of generations, younger generations that are into magic. And I'm awed by your dreams. Uh, one of our favorite books of you is the Chicken Kabbalah. And uh, to, to Brazilian, it was very difficult to translate it. As, uh, we don't have an expression like that. So I would like to, to ask you, why is Chicken Kabbalah? <laughs> Good question. Uh, when... Uh, Years ago, I, uh, uh, my wife and I created a tarot deck called Tarot of Ceremonial Magic. And I wrote a book that uh, Weiser, the publisher Weiser published the book. And uh, it talks, you got to talk about Kabbalah when you talk about tarot, at least, at least I do. And uh, when the, the book Tarot of Ceremonial Magic was first published, this is, wow, long time ago, uh, 90 something, I'm for sure. Uh, the, my publisher arranged a, a, a book launch at a, at a big bookstore in, in Hollywood. And I was talking about the, the Kabbalah at, uh, at the little speech I was giving at the bookstore. And every time I would say uh, a Kabbalistic word, every time I'd say Kabbalah, there was a guy, there was a guy sitting in the front row. And when I, when I said Kabbalah, he'd go, oh. And, or I'd, I'd say, uh, 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 yet Zyra or Kether or, or Asaya or, or, or Adzileth. And he'd go, oh like that. He just would freak out every time I'd say a, or the Hebrew letter, Aleph, Bet, Gimel, you know. He would just freak out and he would, he kept getting madder and madder and angrier and angrier. And uh, at the, at the end of my talk, and everybody else was having a good time, you know, I like to have a good time when I talk and people were laughing and he wasn't laughing everyone else was laughing and uh, afterwards he almost runs up to me and he says what you teach is not Kabbalah you don't even say Kabbalah correctly it is Kabbalah yeah. And I wanted to tell him, look, this is this is magical hermetic Masonic Kabbalah. You know, it's uh, you know, it's uh, pronunciation's not important. <laughs> you know, and uh, he he was very very angry, and I was kind of afraid he was just going to hit me. You know, and uh, he says, "What you teach is not Kabbalah." It is, it is, and he started to think because uh, English obviously wasn't his first language. And he was trying to think of a word, a bad word to describe my Kabbalah. And he said, what you teach is not Kabbalah. It is, it's chicken, chicken Kabbalah. 
And I don't know where he pulled that. Um, maybe the country he came from, that was a big insult, you know. But anyway, and everyone else kind of laughed uh, when he said that. But I didn't laugh. I, I looked at him and I thought, you know, this guy is an angel from God. He's a Kabbalistic angel from God who just gave me the name of the kind of Kabbalah I, <laughs> I teach. And so I wanted to say, well, my rabbi, my rabbi says that uh, there is no correct Hebrew pronunciation. My rabbi says uh, that, uh, uh, <laughs> you know, I, you, don't, you don't have to speak Hebrew to, to learn the Kabbalah. But I didn't have that rabbi. So I started to invent my own rabbi. And that's Rabbi Lamed Ben Clifford. I made him up. And uh, the, uh, a fictitious character. And made up characters are really common in Jewish mystical literature. OK. <laughs> It's a legitimate, it's a, it's a legitimate uh, device of Kabbalistic Jewish literature is to make up, a, yeah. King Solomon didn't write the key to Solomon, okay? <laughs> so somebody in the 1400s wrote the key of Solomon, they said Solomon wrote it. So I decided to make up my own rabbi. And so I sort of split myself in two uh, as I wrote it to have this rabbi who would say all the outrageous and funny, but ultimately really true stuff about the Kabbalah. And then I would stand apart as Lon Duquette and introduce his work. So that's, that's where the Chicken Kabbalah of Rabbi Lama Ben Clifford came from, and I've recently and I recently uh, uh, made up a a three degree Kabbalah initiatory society. <laughs> I just made it up, uh, and I initiated uh, uh, twelve individuals uh, in Beijing, uh, China. Uh, and I visited every every ninety days uh, uh, for uh, an entire year. I went back four times every ninety days, and initiated the same twelve people in the first degree, second degree, third degree, uh, and I broke it up. First degree is the three mother letters, second degree is the seven double letters, third degree is the twelve simple letters of the Hebrew alphabet. And when I got back home, I uh, put that material together in a book called Son of Chicken Kabbalah. <laughs> and uh, that's the initiation ceremonies in that book, so. Well, if they, they could made up three initiates to create the Kaibalion, so you can make a rabbi too. Absolutely. <laughs> Good example, yeah. Uh, uh, the next question, uh, I have to tell you something before. Uh, here in Brazil, we have the Umbanda and Kimbanda that are religions who are based in, in incorporation of spirits. They are similar, but not so much as a voodoo, Santeria, etc. And you have a book that My Life with Spirits, and also another book of you that deals with Enochian magic. And how do you see or how, how are your views in the, the spiritual world? Do you think that there are classes of spirits, like they say? Uh, you have an, ex an, an example of ritual that did work too well, or, or did, didn't go well. I think oh, I will break this I've, question. Into. I've had lots of them not go well. <laughs> <laughs> but it's just like you're, just like uh, the events of your day, okay? 
the events of your day, some of them go well and some of them don't, but you, you do the best you can to get through the day, okay? Same thing with magic. Uh, yeah, uh, I am not uh, familiar and certainly not an expert in uh, the two traditions that you, uh, you talked about. But the idea of layers of, of spirits uh, is uh, universal. Every culture, every culture has the idea because it's a basic fact of life. Okay, but it's not so much that uh, uh, the spirits uh, of uh, uh, an African culture are different in anything else but name and, and appearance from the spirits of a Nordic or a Scandinavian uh, culture. They're all, every spirit is a frequency of consciousness, a layer, a level of consciousness. And the different magical traditions are just different techniques to pinpoint, activate, control and direct specific layers of consciousness. The Enochian system uh, is uh, uh, an elegant example that almost looks like a computer. <laughs> It, almost, it looks like a, a graph. You can almost see the layers, layers of them. But uh, the, uh, Crowley made the audacious statement in the Lesser Key of Solomon, and this was earlier, in, early in his career when he wrote this. He said the Goetic spirits are portions of the human brain. Okay, and that uh, so if you. Uh, the idea being, uh, you know, they say we only use a very small portion of our brains. And if, and if we could use our whole brain, we could walk on water, you know. Well, just imagine if you segmented your brain up into 72 sections and each one of those controlled a talent or a skill or a power. And if you could focus in on that one area there that, that say uh, allows you to uh, uh, understand difficult books. Okay, if you could focus in on that one layer and identify it as a specific Goetic spirit, you've got, uh, you've got uh, uh, a sigil to use to uh, uh, form a connection with it. Uh, in, other, in other words, you have a choreographed drama that helps you focus down to that one little section of, of the brain. It's not really the brain, it's the mind, okay? Crowley should have said the mind, 72 sections of the mind, because the mind is not limited to our cranium. It's not limited to the meat of our brain, okay? The mind is really big. It's so big that there is no outside of it. That's why the, when the rabbi says, it's all in your head, you just have no idea how big your head is, okay? That's what he means. So all of these different systems, uh, the uh, ones with African roots or Scandinavian roots, or, or uh, uh, Greek or uh, Egyptian roots are just different ways, different art forms used to trigger those specific layers of consciousness. And everybody's spirits are as powerful as the natural forces they embody. Here in Brazil, we have basically these two kinds of magi magic. We have the um, occult bibliotech uh, armchair magic that studies a lot of books, but don't go practice. And when he does the minor ritual or the, the other rituals and they don't work, they run to the Umbanda. And Umbanda is a religion, it's an Africa-based religion. 
Uh, it was brought to Brazil by slaves. And now uh, we, we began to study it with an occult view. So, and we realized that it's very, very similar to Kabbalah because you have several uh, layers of spirits that they fit into every sphere of the Kabbalah tree. Uh, but they have archetypes. So when they incorporate, they change personality. Uh, um, we have in, in Telema the God form, né? or God, right. God form. Right. And they incorporate this and they call the, the old man, the old black man, and then the mariners. We have the old women, but they reflect a lot on the Kabbalah. That's why it was so uh, genial. No? And the, the question is, uh, how do you see this, this, all these personalities and they, when they, they bring up and when they incorporate, do you think it's different from the God form that one must assume or the one doing the true will uh, when they become, uh, what I say in Brazil, we, say, we said the universe will converge with you. And when you do something that's on your true will, do you see this as different things as outside creatures, as figments of our imagination and in a big, immense uh, mind, or a mixture of the, the both? Uh, well, ultimately, there is only one big mind. Okay. And you and me are just terminals in that one big mind, just like your computer screen and my computer screen all belong to a one network, okay? And currently you identify as your screen and, and computer and I identify as mine, but we're not the computer we're the network, okay? And there's only one of those. Someday, well, it's like we're asleep and dreaming that we're not one network. We're dreaming that we're separated from it. You and me are dreaming that we're separated from each other. But if we'd wake up a little bit from that dream, we'd see, oh, we're not two people. <laughs> we're, we're one big thing, okay? Illumination, no matter what the tradition is, whether it is Chinese or African or European or Polynesian, illumination is waking up just, and that's just a shift of our consciousness. Someday we will all wake up to realize we've been each other all along, okay? Magic is just one little art form that helps us step by step to wake up. And uh, you, you mentioned that uh, uh, the armchair magicians that study their, their Kabbalah and their, their books and things like that, and then they, they uh, run to a more, uh, 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 visceral uh, uh, kind of magic that they can just jump in and do, it's good. You want to do magic. Magic, you want to do it, you don't want to talk about it. It says, do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law, not study what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law. Or, or even teach what thou wilt, okay? Uh, uh, doing it, uh, it's a cliche, but they say, you know, all the, all the roads lead to the same place. Well, it's absolutely 
It's absolutely true. And it just depends from one moment of your life to another. It just depends on what art form you enjoy, which art form you resonate to. You know, when I was a kid, I used to play army. I used to play cowboy, you know. I resonated to being a cowboy, you know. I resonated to be, be a play soldier. But I don't do that anymore. I'm, I'm a little more awake at the, at the moment. So uh, it would really be a mistake for any one tradition to ridicule or, or denigrate in any way the tradition, uh, uh, traditions of, of others. Because if that's, if that's what that person needs right at this moment to take the next step of waking up from the dream they're currently in, do it. In Brazil, we have uh, everything mixed up. It is a tradition in our country. So we have lots of orders and lots of religions and people mix it with everything. Uh, the other question they asked me to, to ask you is, what can you tell us about your visits to Brazil in the 90s? Well, it was about this time of year, it was December uh, of 1995. Uh, I was asked to go to uh, uh, Rio de Janeiro uh, to help establish a body of OTO and do uh, preliminary initiations there. And I was to uh, uh, do uh, uh, a special initiation for uh, a wonderful, wonderful uh, uh, older gentleman uh, who's now passed away, Euclides uh, Almeida. Uh, and I was, uh, who was a high degree Freemason and, and a very, uh, uh, very wonderful mystical individual. Uh, so I was sent by the OTO to uh, uh, do that. I spent about a week and uh, I, uh, I stayed at the home of uh, uh, two OTO uh, uh, brothers, brother and sister, who were just so incredibly gracious and, and uh, wonderful. And I miss them very much. I want to see them again. Uh, that's uh, Carlos. You know, we were talking about Carlos. Uh, uh, but anyway, on the, the night I arrived, uh, they had a reception for me at uh, Carlos's home at Marisol's. And uh, uh, Euclides came to the reception and I got to meet him for the first time. And uh, uh, I had written a couple books at the time, not, not very many. This is a long time ago, 1995. I'd only written a couple of books. Uh, and, uh, but he was so wonderful and so gracious. And we were, we were out on the balcony smoking Cuban cigars. <laughs> and uh, so, uh, so we met and we hugged and we laughed and we giggled. And he said, I'm going to go back in the kitchen and get a beer. And he went in the kitchen and uh, collapsed and had a major heart attack in the kitchen and fell unconscious on the floor. And Marisol was uh, uh, a physician, so she kept him alive until the ambulance came. And he was taken to the hospital and uh, had open heart surgery. And uh, so uh, we, uh, <laughs> he was okay, he recovered, but we didn't get to uh, do the big fancy initiation that we had uh, uh, planned for him. But instead, uh, 
we did it in his living room uh, on the day I left. I was on my way to the airport and we uh, uh, swang past his house. Uh, we gave him his uh, Minerval initiation in the, the his living room. And uh, then afterwards we took that picture I sent you. Uh, so I don't know if you'll be able to show that, but uh, but anyway, that that was that. We did a series of uh, Minerval initiations and first degree initiations uh, in Rio, and I've never eaten so well in <laughs> life. I that's all I talked about when I got home. I said we just ate from the moment we woke up. So the moment we went to sleep, they didn't even clear the breakfast dishes and lunch was coming out. It's just, I, and I was very big. I was about 300 pounds in those days and I really appreciated the food. <laughs> I have a question from my wife. She said, you are married with Constance for more than 30 years now. How does Telema, Telema influence the relationship? Yeah, well, we've been married 53 years. I, I guess she got that from a book, an old book. <laughs> wow, yes, 53 years. We just celebrated on the night. Um, oh, I don't know if we celebrated, we observed it. Okay. Uh, actually, uh, uh, our, whatever the magic is in our relationship, uh, it's probably bigger than Thelema. <laughs> it, it takes big magic, I think, to uh, stay married for 53 years. Uh, but it's a, it's a funny thing because uh, uh, you know, in the Masons or uh, in the OTO, you know, people, the OTO doesn't invite anybody to join. You know, just Masons don't invite somebody to become a Mason. The person has to ask to become one, you know. And so, uh, uh, Neither of us, not I or Constance, knew what I was getting into when I took that bus trip all night up to uh, Dublin to be initiated in the OTO. But she said, uh, well, I know that they don't invite anybody to join the OTO, and I'm not going to ask, she said. <laughs> and... Uh, so I took my Minerva and I was staying at uh, with Phyllis uh, in Dublin for a couple of days. And she said, you know, it's usually best when, when both the husband and the wife are, are in the OTO. It's just, it's easier on the marriage. It's easier on the, uh, everything else. So Phyllis invited Constance. Constance to join the OTO. She broke with tradition and asked her. And then Constance says, well, if you ask me, I guess I got to do it. You know? <laughs> so we've been, uh, uh, my OTO career isn't my OTO career. It's our OTO career. Uh, I wouldn't uh, been able to do anything that I do uh, without her inspiration, uh, uh, her support, and she does 99% of all the labor I've ever done in the OTO, she's done it. All the initiations, she does all the, all the work, and she makes sure everybody does just what she says. <laughs> So, yes, she's the, I'm just her front man. I think Ram Das uh, said that uh, 
his wife was the Buddha and he was just the Buddha's front, front man. And that's how it is with, with Constance. So she's a wonderful um, uh, priestess at mass. Uh, and uh, she's, uh, uh, of course, now a, a very high degree um, member of the OTO and a member of the international uh, uh, governing bodies and things like that. So uh, Thalima has been very, very good for us. And it's been, I think, good for our son. We uh, have uh, one one child, a boy born in uh, 1972, and he was raised in the OTO from about three years old. He was, he's been an OTO child. And uh, we took him everywhere, uh, but most of the OTO events took place in our home. All the initiations that we ever did, and we've done over a thousand uh, or we've initiated over a thousand people. Uh, that's not a thousand ceremonies, but <laughs> well, yeah, it's a thousand ceremonies, but you know what I mean. Uh, sometimes we've done as many as 25 people at a time. Uh, but we've always done it in our home. And our, our son has, uh, uh, when he was 18 years old, he said he wanted, uh, his Minerva initiation for his, his uh, 18th birthday. And uh, so the OTO has given us and him an extended family of some of the most colorful uncles and aunts and an extended family of uh, brilliant people and artists and stuff. Uh, uh, it's been a wonderful uh opportunity to have a child grow up in at least the Southern California OTO environment. And uh, in, the, in the same subject I have from Ana Luisa, she said, uh, what's um, the, the, the women in, in OTO from 40 years ago to now, how do you see uh, the participation of women in the magic orders and especially in the OTO? Uh, the well in the OTO the uh, uh, women are, are running the are running the show. They're in all the important uh, 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 governing body positions, and uh, it's it's just clear. Uh, just like just like my wife, uh, uh, it's it's. It's clear on a spirit, spiritual level, uh, they seem to have the proper magical instinct for, for, for making things work. Uh, I think membership wise, as far as governing bodies and things, it's well over, it's well over 50% uh, women in, in uh, uh, leadership positions uh, in the OTO. And, uh, uh, so when, when you look at uh, uh, who you have to deal with in committees and, and things, uh, and especially in, uh, well, there are certain OTO degrees, uh, of course, where the, uh, the female officer uh, uh, has, the, uh, has the last word in making in making decisions on things, uh, uh, in the Gnostic Mass, if if there's uh, any uh, uh, a question about uh, uh, how certain things should uh, should happen during a Gnostic Mass, uh, it's it's the priestess who makes the decision of how she wants it, and uh, the same thing with. Uh, with uh, several other degrees. In Brazil, about the, the wife things, I, we say that uh, when we are married in the occult world, the man has the last word that is, yes, madam. <laughs> <laughs> yep. 
<laughs> yes. I have a question from Bruno Mais. He says, besides all your experience uh, from all of them, what would be your favorite achievement? Uh, gee, uh, well, uh, lasting this, this long uh, and uh, being uh, able to uh, continue to do uh, things I love, uh, create, teach, and every once in a while play some music. Uh, my greatest achievement is, is uh, that I've been able to keep a roof over our head. Uh, because to tell you the truth, I'm pretty much uh, uh, a bum. Uh, <laughs> the, you know, we've never had a, a new car. We've never owned a home. Uh, we've never had a credit card. Uh, and we live very uh, modestly. Uh, but we've always been able to uh, live in neighborhoods that we we like and we feel safe in. Uh, we've always had a roof over our heads and we've always uh, uh, had food to eat. And we've always had fun. And I think the, the greatest achievement uh, is just general happiness, being 72 years old and being generally happy. When I was a little kid, uh, you know, I said I couldn't walk. And uh, so my uh, parents, if I went outside, they'd have to carry me outside. And uh, once my uh, father put me up on his, on his shoulders and uh, in the evening out in the backyard, and we saw a falling star. And uh, no, it wasn't a falling star. It was uh, uh, the the first star that appeared in the sky, you know, as as the sun was going down. And he said, uh, and he told me, well, you know, if you make a wish, the second you see the first star in the sky, you know, your wish might come true. And uh, so the, there was only one star in the sky and I looked at it and all I could think of to wish for was that I wish to be happy. And since that day or since that night, that's been my continual wish on the first star is just to be happy. And so far, it's worked out. So magic works. What's that? So oh, magic yeah. works. oh, God, yeah. Magic works. You believe in magic. <laughs> yeah, well, I do, yeah. Uh, I have some, just two more questions. Um, Carlos, I see Carlos. Yes. Hello, my friend. Okay. Carlos asked some of the, these questions. He said he would, wouldn't miss this or anything in the world. Oh. After we, we stop recording, uh, I will open all the cameras and we can talk about okay. other things. Just two more questions. Uh, one is that before the pandemic, you had a prolific work in the community with Monday Night Magic, auto gatherings, the music gigs, and now you became a video caster. How it was this transition and how you're feeling about this change in the future years? Uh, well, I was really sad because I had to cancel uh, uh, speaking trips to Hong Kong and, and Vienna. <laughs> At the, at the first of the year. And uh, 
uh, you know, I said we, we live very uh, modestly in uh, uh, my speaking engagements and my, uh, uh, I usually do a concert when I speak. Uh, that's kind of my income, you know, you don't make a lot of money writing books, but uh, you make a little money talking about <laughs> writing <laughs> writing books. And uh, so uh, my good friends at Magical Egypt, uh, the documentary people, uh, were kind enough to say that they would they would help uh, uh, arrange and direct a, a few Zoom kind of uh, uh, workshops. And so I've been doing Zoom workshops on Enochian and Kabbalah and Tarot and uh, uh, Solomonic magic. And, uh, and I enjoy it very much. I just sort of set up, you know, sort of si similar to this, but I also share my uh, PowerPoint uh, presentations. And, and uh, so each of my talks are are uh, accompanied by about 200 slides too. And uh, I'm enjoying it very much. And uh, so I've, uh, so far I've eased into that, uh, I've transitioned into that uh, uh, virtual uh, lecturing uh, quite easily. As far as Monday night magic class, now I do something every day on Facebook. I, uh, I've been reading uh, little 20 minute excerpts from my books. And so far I've gone through quite a few of my books. <laughs> I've read the whole thing on Facebook every morning. And uh, right now we're on uh, the Understanding Crowley's Soth Tarot. So. So I've been keeping busier than I've uh, than I would have normally been uh, uh, in non-pandemic times, but uh, I can't wait for the pandemic uh, to allow me to uh, travel again. And I hope to come to Brazil. You have to come to Brazil. Yes, we'll take you to Samambanda. Okay, we can talk to spirits live. Very good. <laughs> Uh, um, Damien is, uh, is asking, how can we find more about your work and these Zoom meetings? Well, the, the advantage of the Zoom meetings is that for, we from Brazil could uh, see our classes. Okay, which could oh, yeah, them. there's people from, uh, 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 people attend the Zoom uh, classes from all over the world. Uh, I think every continent except Antarctica. Okay. Uh, uh, yeah. Do you know the, the links? Because this will be a podcast in YouTube. You can get these links in the description of, of this video. Uh, uh, I will put that. I will, I will get to you after okay. the interview. And they, uh, if you are looking this in YouTube, uh, the links are below. Okay. And, and if they're on Facebook, they can find me on, on Facebook, and that's where I make my uh, 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 initial announcements for the next Zoom class. And also, uh, all of them are recorded and uh, are, are uh, available, well, available for purchase, okay, uh, yeah. Uh, so if, if you're interested in Enochian or uh, 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 Tarot or Kabbalah, uh, all of those ones that I've already done, you can you can uh, order those too. So, well, oh, that's great. Uh, the links are, are in the description. And okay. our last question is: What advice would you give to the people who are just getting started with magic? Keep your sense of humor, enjoy yourself, and uh, uh, start to study what you are most attracted to at, at the moment. And uh, uh, you will be your own best teacher if you just keep your sense of humor and, and uh, uh, 
immediately study what you're most attracted to. There's Carlos. What did so long. It's a pleasure to me to see you again. Oh, pleasure to see you too. I miss you. Oh, I'm too. No, uh, you look very well. You look very well to me. Oh, thank you. I lost some weight since you saw me last. In 1995, I, I was looking for a Santa Claus in the airport. Now <laughs> you're so... <laughs> oh. Oh. Now you're, you, you are better, better. Well, I feel better too. Very nice to see you again, Lon. Nice to see you too. Uh, can, can you answer, answer me a, a little question? Sure. Um, how did you meet Greg McMurtry? Uh, I had arranged uh, to take my Minerval initiation. It took uh, uh, a year and a half of me writing letters back and forth between Phyllis. He was married to Phyllis at the time. Uh, I started writing, I think, in 1972 or 73. Okay, and they thought I was cr a crazy nutcase of some kind, and they were kind of uh, afraid that I might be a, an occult crazy because, uh, uh, and I didn't know who I was talking to. Uh, uh, they only used their magical names, and I didn't even know who I was communicating to. And they were very careful because there had been some, some robberies of occult uh, libraries. Carl Germers and Israel Regardis had their libraries uh, stolen. And uh, they weren't initiating people yet. They hadn't started initiating. And I didn't know that, you know. And I wrote them some pretty stupid sounding letters at first. <laughs> <laughs> and so... Uh, 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 so I didn't know who, who it was when they finally said, okay, uh, uh, after I sent them my, my uh, birth information so Phyllis could do my chart, my astrology chart. Uh, once I gave her my chart, uh, they figured that I must be harmless. And they, they, then they scheduled my initiation. And I had to take a bus up there, uh, but uh, I stayed with Phyllis. And uh, the first night, uh, Grady came home. She was married to Phyllis, and Grady uh, worked in Berkeley, and uh, which was about oh, 30 miles away. And uh, so I first met him when he came home for dinner. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I, I was going to finish, but there's one great question. Damien asked it. Uh, you said about the, the network and we are all connected and everything. How does free will work in this scheme? Uh, you have no choice but to, uh, to exercise your free will. <laughs> Well, Lon, thank you very, very much from the bottom of our hearts. We are delighted to have this conversation. Well, it's been my pleasure. I will just say goodbye to the people on YouTube and then I will open mics and we will ask you some other question and we can okay. talk. All right. Bom, e se você acompanhou a gente até aqui, então não esquece de dar o seu like, seguir o canal e acompanhe a gente no próximo Bate-Papo Mayhem.